This episode of the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler is made possible in part by the Women Working with Clay Symposium, taking place June the 13th through the 15th at Hollins University in Roanoke, Virginia. Founded in 2011, this symposium honors the accomplishments of women ceramic artists working today. The symposium features a weekend full of ideas, demonstrations, and discussions. The 2022 presenters include Margaret Bowles, Chutsani Elaine Dean, Lorna Meaden, Linda Sorman, and a special keynote address by Dr. Mary Dana Hinton, the president of Hollins University. For more information or to register, please visit hollins.edu slash www.wwc. Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 415 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. Today on the show, I talk with Russell Rankel, who is a sculptor based in Utah. In this interview, we talk about his use of animals as poetic visual symbols, as well as the founding of Shape Theory Collective. He started the online gallery and collective to raise money for criminal justice reform specifically The Last Prisoner Project, which works to free individuals jailed for nonviolent drug crimes. If you'd like more information, you can visit his website, that's russellrankle.com, or you can visit shapetheorycollective.com. Before we get to that, I wanted to mention I'm having a Mother's Day sale starting this Friday, the 29th of April. I'll be uploading new work to my website at carterpottery.com, and you can check that out Friday at 5. There'll be new work. And then there'll also be an update on Saturday. Again, the website for that is carterpottery.com. Also wanted to take a minute and thank the folks that have donated to our show. We are listener supported, so I'd like to thank Stephen Earp, Johnson Creek Clay Studio, and Pama Fitzgerald for their recent contributions. If you'd like to get involved yourself, you can do that at the website. That's talesofaredclayrambler.com slash donate. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Let's start talking about growing up. I think you grew up in Southern California, right? Right. Yep. Yeah. And what uh, what was that like? What was that environment like? Well, I grew up in Palm Springs, California, which is, if you know anything about Palm Springs, um, there's a lot of movie stars and extremely wealthy people there. And then there's the service industry that services the wealthy people. I mean, there's a huge dichotomy between the middle class service workers and the extreme wealth. And my dad was a gardener. Uh, and I grew up mowing lawns, mowing lawns, Steve McQueen's lawn, Barry Manilow's lawn. Uh, who else? Anyway, well, uh, William Holden, he's kind of a minor movie star, but some folks might know who he is. And then uh, Liberace, mowed Liberace <laughs> lawn. Yeah, so, and that's not a euphemism. I literally mowed the lawn. Um, but, but the the growing up there was this infatuation with wealth with my with my parents like they were really insecure about wealth like they didn't feel comfortable around wealthy people and so that kind of uh, energy was transferred to me in a way um but we could talk about that in a second but the significant part of mowing those lawns is um working in those built environments was those were really uh 
like today, the, the houses that I worked in are really um, icons of mid-century modern. And so at the time, I didn't think anything of it. I just hated working for my dad, you know, like it was the father-son relationship and that was really fraught. And um, and I was just pretty much in survival mode back then, you know, 14 to probably, I don't know. He, we started, I started working for him when probably I was 12 and quit when I was 16 and angry and hated my dad. And But it, it's the recent past when I... Uh, decide or figured out that maybe those built environments had an influence on me, um, maybe in the subconscious. Um, I'm trying to remember the architect's name, but um, you would know them. I, I wish I, I would have known. That, I mean, I have them written down. I've written about that experience mowing those lawns, but or working in those built environments. But there were just, I go back and look at pictures because um, you, you, you can just type in the name of the architects and those houses, those dwellings will pop up. Um, and so I just think some somehow being in those environments probably influenced me artistically in some way. Um, yeah, so growing up in Palm Springs and plus it was hot as hell there and I couldn't get out of there fast enough for a number <laughs> of reasons. The, the fraught relationship I had with my parents and then the heat and then just that that dichotomy like i was all of my friends were really wealthy and so they they went off to grad school like they would go to ucla and usc and brigham young university and i i was raised in an environment i was raised in a uh what do you call it uh um it in, well, we didn't, my parents didn't believe in education. They just believed that you could go out and get a job. And so I did construction jobs and my dad would, was really proud of me for having construction jobs because his idea of, of masculinity was being able to have a working class job to dig ditches. Like, like he was really impressed that I could work all day behind a shovel. Um, and so I thought that's what I was going to do. And my academics were like, I, I graduated with straight F's. There's no reason why I should have graduated from high school. I, I smoked a lot of marijuana and, um, yeah, I was, so anyway, yeah, I talked to my students and I tell them those stories and I say, man, there is no reason why I should be a college professor based on my high school career, just because I didn't study one iota in high school. In fact, I, I would say I was pretty much illiterate by the time I graduated from high school because I went on that LDS mission and I wrote letters home to my parents about my experiences. And I read those letters after a year or two of college. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe. I mean, I was, I can't believe how poorly I, like my grammar and my spelling. And um, I couldn't believe how, um, illiterate I was but I read a lot of religious books on that mission and that taught me how to read and I read like there's some Eld Mormon books that are really uh, really complicated things to read and so I would read it with a dictionary by my side and just look up every other word and so that that Mormon mission taught me how to read basically yeah well, we're, we're going to talk more about the, the mission, but I, I wanted to back up to the gardening, actually. I've, I spent a ton of time being a landscaper as well. But the, the difference in Palm Springs is it is dry. It is it is so dry there. I've actually never been, I've only driven through the desert around there. I've never actually been into the, the town town. But essentially, you're, you know, you're bringing water and resources to grow green things <laughs> in the middle of an otherwise sparse, pretty sparse oh, desolate. desert. Yeah. There's something about the fantasy of that that I find to be interesting. And, and you find this in rich resort areas. I mean, Vegas is a classic example. Yeah, like you're, yeah. you drive out of the desert and then you put enough money and enough fantasy and all of a sudden you have this lush kind of tropical vibe. But it's the fantasy that's interesting to me because as an artist, I think that's what we do. We negotiate fantasy, you know, through the objects we make. Do you think that fantasy part gave you permission in any way to fantasize yourself later in your art career? Well, I never thought of that as fantasy. I've only thought about the environmental impact of making the desert green. When I was growing up, 
golf course. I mean, golf courses are still the thing there, but Palm Springs is built over an aquifer. And as I understand it, I haven't read about this in years, but as I understand it, those golf courses and all the swimming pools there are depleting the aquifer. And what's happening is the, the aquifer is then caving in so it can't uh, retain more water. And so it shouldn't be much too far in the future where that aquifer might run dry. At least that's been the predictions forever and ever. And when I was, gro when I was growing up, it was a dry heat. And now it's a, it's a wet heat because of all of the greenery and all of the swimming pools. It's really humid in Palm Springs now, which is really interesting. But in terms of fantasy, I w I'd have never considered that. I don't know what gave me the, the courage to be an artist. Um, I bounced around a lot in college. I, I took accounting. I thought I was going to be a, be an accounting because of the, some of the friends I hung out with in college were majoring in business. And I thought, Oh man, that's what I should do to be rich, you know? And then I remember sitting next to a guy at BYU. He had one of those, um, calculators, those business calculators. I don't even know what they're called anymore, where you would do all these different programs. And on one, and on the inside of the flap of his, um, calculator he had a lamborghini a picture of a lamborghini and that was his whole motivation for that and those were the types of students i was hanging out with and i just couldn't i didn't know why i just didn't agree with that i didn't know anything about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and all that stuff but but it just the pursuit of that was meaningless to me just the pursuit of money for the sake of money um and so i just bounced around i I took English and I was going to be an English major. Um, and then I was discouraged by a girlfriend that broke my heart. Her, she was a wealthy person from the East coast and her dad influenced me and said, um, if you, you'll never be able to make enough money to keep my daughter happy. And, and I was, you know, I was very impressionable because he was like a New York city lawyer and got carried to, work in a limousine from New Jersey and all that stuff. So I was like, oh, okay. So then I changed my major, blah, blah. We broke up and then I took a pottery class and then talk about English, one low earning major to a lower earning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that was it. I just said, well, it, you know, and I had taken some English classes and I talked to, that's where I started thinking about intrinsic motivation and, doing things for the right reason. And I, and I thought, well, shoot, I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing something I hate and then retiring, you know, and then finally doing something that you love. So I decided to pursue that. So let's talk about the mission. Some part of the religious faith is that you go out and I think it's two years, right? That you uh -huh. go on yeah. a mission. Where, where did you go? What was the location? Upstate, upstate New York. And you go around and you, you talk to people face to face, if you can, yeah. <laughs> if it works, you know what I mean? And there's something about that that seems so outgoing, you know, like when I think I'm, a, a lot of my own religious practice has been meditation, which is like completely solitary. No one else is around. It, was it hard to talk to strangers about faith? Yeah, it was really hard. I didn't like it. I, I tried to trick myself into liking it, I guess. But yeah, I, I mean, we called it tracting where you would just go door to door and we would go like all day, all day for weeks on end, knocking on doors and setting appointments and maybe getting discussion. They're called discussions and maybe getting a discussion or two every other day or so. And yeah, I didn't, I didn't like that part of it. It was just so exhausting, but you know, there were some really good experiences. You know, I look back and I think I think I should probably reach out to some of those people that I converted and apologize <laughs> <laughs> just because, uh, you know, all these years later, if they added up all the tithing they they paid, they would get a significant raise. <laughs> when we stopped going to church, that was the the nice thing. We got a 10 percent raise automatically because we didn't have to pay tithing anymore. But I had some great I had some great experiences. You have written, you you are a blogger as well, and people can read the blog posts on your website, and I, I recommend they do, because you've written some some really nice comparisons between the Mormon 
at least the missionary lifestyle where you did have definitive rules and then art making. And I, I want you to compare that a little bit for us. Like when are rules a good thing and when are rules a bad thing? I wish I would have read that before this because I haven't <laughs> thought I haven't thought about that for a minute, but Yeah, to give you context, you were actually talking about it in students, where you see students sometimes rules help them and sometimes rules like shut them down. Like they they can't get any farther because they're too fixated on a rule. Yeah. So I think maybe what I was getting at, well, I could just I could talk about our field for a little bit. Um, like, like take wood firing, for example. I think there's, I think wood firing is a perfectly fine way to um, create a surface. And I think it's a completely fine way to fire your work. But I think there are, is fundamentalist thinking associated with wood firing or, or any kind of firing. Like there's fundamentalist electric fire firers out there. Right. And like, it's, one way our wood firing is the only way I remember at BYU. This is where I started thinking about fundamentalism. I didn't think about it. I didn't relate religious fundamentalism and artistic fundamentalism at that time. But I remember there was a grad student at BYU and she, th- there was just one way that you could put a cone pack in a guile kiln and it had to, it had to bend to the right. <laughs> and there's no other way you could do that. And it was, and even back then, so that was one form of fundamentalism, just one way. It's not like it, she wasn't willing to adapt to the situation, right? And to, and to pivot when pivot pivoting was needed. It was like you had to jump through all these crazy, crazy hoops to make the cone pack go a certain way. And then I, I came up at the tail end of cone 10 reduction. Remember when that was a leg- legitimate, the only legitimate way to fire work? I don't know if you remember those yeah, days. Yeah, me too. I came up at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was brought up in that. I believed that for a, a short period of my career. Like, nope, it has to be reduction and cone 10. And the cone pack has to bend to the left. <laughs> <laughs> Never bought into the cone pack thing, but, but I did buy into the uh, cone 10 stuff. The thing about the fundamentalist when it's in a religious context is that someone is giving it to you. But then in the artistic context, you can say that like a teacher or or master uh, artist is going to give you, here's your boundaries. But what I'm more interested in is how we come up with boundaries ourselves to help our creativity. So for instance, like for me, I I don't have a ton of colors in, in the way that I use glaze, but I do have consistent things. I got red clay, white slip. Like I try to keep the palette somewhat, you know, um, there's boundaries on the palette that I use, but then I love setting up those boundaries and then throwing them out when I have a good idea that's outside the boundary. So I, I think for me, the fundamentalism, there's something good about boundaries, but for creativity, boundaries are positive because you push against them, not because you adhere to them. <laughs> yeah, I like I like within the context of your red clay and white slip, like there's a whole universe of possibility there. And so you can there's so so many ways to explore that. Like um don't you use glaze over that those yeah. white slip too? Yeah, I thought yeah. so. Um, yeah. And just the way the glaze responds to the white slip and how you apply the white slip will affect the way the glaze responds to the white slip. And so, yeah, within that, there's a whole universe of interesting things that you could explore. And I use red clay in my sculpture. Um, I'm now transitioning to white earthenware slip cast, which is a whole nother thing, but, um, yeah, imposed self-imposed versus imposed from the outside, like imposed from childhood. I, I mean, I was raised Mormon, but my parents weren't fundamentalist by a long shot. And so I, I took on the fundamentalism voluntarily just because um, I thought that was the way to go at the time. And plus, um, I wasn't raised in an academic house. And like I mentioned, I was I graduated with straight F, so I was really insecure about my ability to learn. And my intelligence, I was ra- we were raised in a fixed uh, mindset household uh, versus growth. Like fixed is you're born with what you have, um, you can't learn. And, and, I, 
And so since I didn't study in high school, I got bad grades. And since I got bad grades, I figured I wasn't that smart. And, and so trying on fundamentalism was sort of a substitute for all of that stuff. Like, oh, if, I, if I'm not good at this, I could be good at this other thing. Because I was really good at digging ditches. Like I could, I could turn my brain off and work my ass off. And that was like a badge of honor for me. And I could also turn my brain off and be a fundamentalist. You know what I mean? And so, well, that was, I'm pretty impressed that I just said that. I got to write that down. (laughs) That was the, anyway. (laughs) So I turned my brain, so I could turn my brain off and be a fundamentalist. Wow. So. You mentioned that in ceramics that there's this fundamentalist streak. At, at one point, you were making functional pots. This was when you were in, in Tuckerville. Um, and you were making functional pots and making a living, right? That that was the, the thing at that time? It was a lower middle class living. I think our best year, we made $50,000, and I still had a part-time job. And what was the aesthetic? What what were the pots? What they look um, like? they were soda fire, like Minge soda, like a generation removed from Minge soda. I went to grad school with Southern Illinois University, and that was a big streak there. And so I was using Arebes and soda firing. I had a couple of soda kilns and a gas kiln, but yeah, I was it was primarily soda fired. Um, so it'd be like a, a uh, red slip. I forgot what the slips are now because I haven't used them forever. Um, with a, a rebay over that with um, wax resist patterns and that kind of stuff. And it was really that kiln. Ted Neal came out and built that kiln. I think he was a student or no, he was a adjunct up at Utah State. And he brought a bunch of students down and we knocked that kiln out in a couple of days. Um, but it fired really well. It was a great little kiln. But yeah, it was just that kind of stuff. And it wasn't um, the kind of if I were smarter and a better entrepreneur, I would have come up with easier ways to fire and produce the work. But I didn't think entrepreneurially at the time. I just thought um, I had a fundamentalist mindset. Like it had to be a certain way, right? You can't, you can't, I, I didn't allow myself to be, to succumb to the marketplace. Like the marketplace was going to come to me, you know, and, and I was going to convince them what was worth worth buying. And the work was great. There's nothing wrong with the work, but I guess if I were to start that Tokerville pottery again, knowing what I know now, I would probably do things a lot differently and think more about the marketplace and satisfying the needs of the customer and that kind of stuff. But yeah, I was a, I had some fundamentalist thinking back then now that I'm talking about it. At at what point did sculpture um, come into the, the process of your making? Well, I made sculpture in undergraduate school. So my grad undergrad, my BFA show consisted of sculptural ceramics. They were, I mean, sculptural like teapots. I was back in the sculptural teapot days. And they were kind of in alignment with the sculpture that I made, which were a series of uh, five, like three foot long ceramic ants with bronze legs. And then I built a ceramic pedestal and I put them in this environment. And so the teapots and the vessels that I made had the segmented uh, parts to it, like an ant would. And so there was like this relationship between the two. And then I went off to graduate school. Um, Well, I graduated with both of those bodies of work. And then I applied to graduate school at Southern Illinois University with the sculpture. And I didn't get in. I... I, I applied with Ted Neal um, and Ben Bates and Ben Bates and Ted Neal got in and I didn't, I got on the waiting list. And so by then we were lit, we were living in St. Louis, just over the river from Edwardsville. And I had a studio in my father-in-law's auto body shop. And, and after I didn't get in after that disappointment and then just starting to hustle a pottery shop, in uh, St. Louis, I decided, well, this will this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a potter in St. Louis for the rest of my life. But then on a whim, I applied the next year to the same university and got in, but I applied with pottery. So the first time I applied with sculpture, the second year I applied with pottery, got in with the pottery, and I thought, oh, so the pottery is better. And so I went in making pots. And then about halfway through the three-year term 
Dan Anderson, I remember this, I distinctly remember this. He took me out to the kiln yard and we sat down and basic, I don't remember the exact words, but he said, if you don't start figuring your shit out, you're going to be out of here. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And I thought the pots were good, but I was still referencing the Minge Soda stuff. I was looking at Linda Christensen. I mean, all my work back then was Linda Christensen and in that style of work, I didn't have and have a voice. My, I didn't, I wasn't inserting my voice into the, into the work back then. And so then he said, um, he referenced this, he remembered the sculpture that I applied with the first, first time around. And he said, maybe start thinking about that work. And so I did. And then about the same time, I took an art history, a pre-Columbian art history class and started looking at the animals, uh, particularly the pre-Columbian or the Nayarit dogs. Um, they're the big fat dogs with the open tail. And so that's the first animal that I made. It looked just like those, those pre-Columbian dogs, but I would put a twist on it. Um, and, and that was the beginning of the animal direction. And, and then I graduated and, uh, taught part-time in Denver and started making pottery again, and then moved to Tokerville and made pottery full-time all the while making sculpture, but just kind of on the side. And then, um, one thing led to another and I just got bored with pottery. It got to the point where I got so into making the sculpture that when we would have our holiday sale, I would look at the calendar and, um, realized that I didn't have enough pots on my shelf and then have to quit the sculpture for a month or two to make the pots and my heart, it was the intrinsic extrinsic motivation thing. And so I just got to the point where I don't, I don't love this anymore. I don't want to make pottery anymore. So I stopped. I don't know if you read that blog post that said I quit. Oh no, I didn't read that one. Yeah. I, I do like, though, when things naturally peter out, you know, like when, when I talk to younger students that they're like trying to assert themselves in the work, I, I'll, I often try to reassure them like you're already you like just keep working. It's going to happen. You don't have to really try that hard. You just got to make enough work that you either get bored of making this body of work and then make a new body of work. Like like I mistakenly thought that I could try on a pottery aesthetic and the somehow that would fit. And that just does not work. It's better if you just work. <laughs> yeah. 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 Make a lot of work. I remember distinctly, I had a row of, and those teapots that I, that I made were really nice. I thought, I mean, I still look back. Do you ever look at work that uh, you explored? This is kind of a little bit different, but have you ever started a body of work or started a piece? Like I, like I'm thinking of some figurative work that I made, and I never considered myself a figurative sculptor. And so, so I worked on this thing, and I worked on this thing. It was a this female form with a with a hairstyle of I think one of the Jetson characters, and and then I made this male form, and I wanted to make the male form. Um, just so that I can make a, oh, what do you call those things that go around there? Oh, a rabbit, a rabbit for a stole. I wanted, I just wanted to put a stole around. I just wanted to make this guy so I can make this stole. And both of the, I, I've t and I quit, I abandoned both of those pieces because I didn't think they were any good. And then a year or two later, they pop up on my memories or something. I'm like, oh my God, who made that? Shit, I made that. That is fucking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but but like, there's so much work out work that I've quit that, um, that I wish I hadn't of. And who knows what I'd be making today had I not been so insecure. I mean, part of that is like, oh, only real artists are make the figure. I'm, I'm not a real artist. I'm a, I'm a potter or something. But anyway, I remember distinctly those, um, a row of, I don't know, eight teapots. They were, it was the body of the teapot. I had the spouts ready to apply and the handles. I'm like, I don't want to do this. So I, I, just the idea of sitting down for a day and a half, finishing those just uh, filled me with like just boredom and anxiety. And I'm like, I'm not doing them. Didn't, and that was the last time.
Well, when I was looking back over your website to look at the sculptural work, the the things that either are animals or, or that reference animals, there there's this progression where I can almost see you working in series, but they're character series as opposed to like a line of teapots. You're making hair like rabbits, you know, over and over again as the character, but then it, every single one is slightly different. You know, like body posture changes. At some point, the rabbit comes out of the skin and becomes wrapped around something else. Right, but, yeah. But can you talk about establishing a character like a rabbit or other animals that you you like them enough to come back to them over and over again? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm kind of at a, at a place right now where I'm not sh- sure if I'm going to keep making animals. Um, I finished a piece recently. I'll, I'll show you. It hangs on the wall. It's a skull it's a bighorn sheep skull and the horn here and the anyway um i was i was into this piece but but it takes a lot more um for me to enjoy making animal sculptures and i I don't know what's happening um with in that regard i may be done making animals but your question what was your question again well thinking about when you have a character that you that you like to return to so i think oh. from like two th- at least on images on the website it was like 2011 all the way up till you know somewhat recently yeah that piece that's uh that's this year yeah so what is it about the rabbit as a symbol that's interesting so growing growing up in the middle of the desert um i was given a 22 rifle when I was like nine years old or whatever. And instead of shooting cans, which I shot plenty of cans, I started shooting rabbits. And <clears throat> so it's a reference to that period of my life when I would just sh- kill everything in sight. And um, part of me was, I don't know. Yeah. So, so, and mostly rabbits and I would skin the rabbits because f- somehow in the back of my mind, I thought there was a, there was a, a rabbit fur buyer out there that would buy all these mangy (laughs) jack rabbit furs from me. And, uh, and so I skin and I would have, I had like piles of pelts laying around and they were just like flea ridden. Like I didn't know how to process them. You know, I would just skin them and stretch them out on a board and they would just bake in the sun and the fur would fly away. But, um, so that's what that's why you see the skin stretched because I understand how that works and um, so it's a reference to those days and then just formally the rabbit is a really interesting form with the big ears and how you can create such expression with those ears and um, and they're also um, a symbol of fertility and so there's the whole sex thing going on. I remember my former colleague Susan and Harris and I were compare comparing stories about our recently deceased parents her mom had died a year or so before four and i had just gotten back from my dad's funeral and we were having lunch and and i guess the rabbits were still kind of new um well it would have been what eight years ago so still kind of new um she asked what are those rabbits rabbits all about anyway and i just i just said sex and she her comment just just seared and it was so perfect and she said sex is the perfect anecdote anecdote to death i'm like oh my god how how profound and it's so true um and so then i started thinking about them as a fertility symbol and you know death versus life and then I started to fold in this, this childhood experience of being introduced to pornography at a too young of an, of an age by some neighbors that lived out near where we lived. The, the, the movie was Deep Throat. Do you, have you ever heard of that? I have, but I've actually never seen it. That was the first porn movie that showed in normal theaters, right? Right. Yeah. It was supposed to be, it was supposed to be groundbreaking in that regard. It was an art. It was a, a, artistic mainstream movie yeah yeah and so so yeah i was probably i don't remember 12 i'm gonna i'm gonna tell some uh, nobody's gonna hear this right (laughs) so so i remember i'm gonna this is a i've never told this story before so there were these two guys they they were a couple they lived out about a mile away and their property was surrounded by all these huge tamarisk trees which were used for both windbreaks and privacy 
and they had this um they had this horse named banshee i don't remember what kind of it was a white horse and one sunday afternoon we were having family dinner after church and out on the dirt road in front of our house was banshee the horse who was being ridden by a naked woman and so you know this is back in the what would have have been the mid 70s so that was kind of like the tail end of the hippie era you know riding horses naked and all that stuff (laughs) so i knew the horse but i didn't know the lady (laughs) (laughs) and so i was more interested in the lady so uh, so uh the next day i got my dad's binoc well i i went to explore this property you know i just kind of went around the outskirts of the property to see what was going on and i found that lady sunbathing naked above the horse stall so so in one hand she had a fly swatter and the other she had a drink a cocktail and she was slapping the flies because she was right next to the horse stall sunbathing completely naked and so i ran home and got my dad's binoculars and (laughs) ran back and crawled military style behind like these scraggly desert bushes you know and she saw me and she sat up and looked who's this kid out there uh, Bill was this guy's name. He also had pigeons. So I decided I wanted to be pigeon guy. What do you call pigeon keepers? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. Anyway, I suddenly became interested in pigeons because Bill had pigeons and there was a naked lady on Bill's property. And so so I went and uh, feigned interest in pigeons. And so I got some of his pigeons, brought them home, raised pigeons for a minute. And anyway, o- over time... Um, I, I insinuated myself in that with, with those people. And I can barely remember her cause I was so young, but one of those occasions, one afternoon I went there and they said, come on in, we want to show you something. And they, sh- and this was probably when deep throat first came out. So they were probably really excited about it. And they showed me deep throat. Well, as you're telling me the story, it makes me think about how your your experience has been that of opposites. You know, you go from this childhood curiosity, which is totally normal, even if it was, you know, early to see porn. Like, this is a pretty normal thing. And yeah. then you kind of go the other way into the Mormon faith and the mission. In the sculpture itself, I, I, I see that dichotomy also. You know, like you'll have like the piece you showed, you know, it's it's the head and torso of a rabbit that's stretched around hard bone. So you have something that's really vibrant and alive that's stretched around something that is, you know, that is already dead. Mm, yeah. So are you interested in that dichotomy? Like, is that the work or at least that body of work? Maybe not dichotomy. I think I would... Uh, I'm more interested probably in the word tension. Okay. The tension between the two. Um, I remember leaving um, Bill's house. I forgot what his partner's name was, but I remember leaving Bill's house and the house we lived in was um, just a gentle slope about a half a mile away, but I could, the trail that went from his house to my house um, ended directly in front, in front of our the front of our house and you could see inside of my house. And I remember going home after we're watching or being introduced, like being introduced to all kinds of stuff at that house. And then going home and seeing my mom making dinner and just this and feeling really weird about being in this environment and then coming into this other more domestic mother and dad environment, you know? So so, yeah, I would just say more about tension than about dichotomy. I want there to be like some discomfort, but also some rest, I guess. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I, I don't mind a little discomfort, but I'm also rethinking that work, like the, the times that we're in and all the cruelty that we're, we're experiencing and the work that I make has an element of cruelty to it because, you know, I'm stretching, I'm, stretching the skin of rabbits. I mean, these rabbits are alive, but they're not really because they couldn't be because they're all of their innards are removed. And so I'm starting to question, do I want to put that, that tension in the world anymore? I'm not sure. 
There's a sculpture you made, and, and I've seen you use this before, where you'll have one animal that's eating another animal, like it will be coming out of its mouth. And then a th- and then there's one I'm thinking about, there's a, even a third animal that's in the mouth of the second animal. And it does seem like a life cycle type thing, you know, like this eats that, eats that. Yeah, it's that piece. I just finished that piece. It's right there. Do you see it? Yeah, yeah. That's the only one I've done. Those pieces are great because there's so many metaphors in there. You know, just the idea that like culture consumes culture consumes culture, you know, like that as, as the visual metaphor, but also that you're, you're such an expert sculptor that when I saw the image, I just started geeking out because one, one of the animals is a, is a lizard, is a lizard. So you start to, I was just thinking about the process, like of making this and how realistic does it need to be so that I, as the viewer get sucked in like that. Oh, well, that's a debate that I have in my mind all the time. Like I I talk to students about you're giving a gift to the viewer if you don't give them all the answers. And so if so, if my work is hyper realistic, um, I think it it would miss something. And and I, I take your compliment that I'm a great sculptor, but I also believe that my lack of skill, if we can call it that, is actually a benefit. Because I think there's there's something beautiful about the naivete of my work, about the inaccuracy of it. Um, I think that's like I see sculptors out there that are just like figurative sculpture that that really have the human form down to perfection. And I mean, part of me envies that skill, but it, but another part of me thinks that work is is even though it's made by humans, it's lacking the human touch uh, or because we're all imperfect. And if you, I mean, I'm sure the sculptor of those pieces views the work as imperfect, but from my point of view, it's um, close to as perfect as humanly possible. And I don't know, I, I could be just talking myself in circles here, but, and maybe I'm just trying to justify my lack of skill, but I, I, I don't know. You look at like I just got back from Mexico City and we were at the museum of I forgot. Uh, it was just a historical museum. It's a really famous museum. I forgot the the word. The Museum of Anthropology. And I visited a lot of that work that I saw in graduate school when I took that art history class. And a lot of that work was uh, is in all the books that I've looked at and the images that I've seen and referenced. And just the naivete of that work just is so powerful, just so. And that's something that I want to capture in my work is is like a an element of innocence, I guess. Um, um, yeah, yeah. So I I take the compliment, but I hope I don't ever get so good that that you might as well just look at a real lizard. Does that make sense? Yeah, in in in. With the rabbits or, or, or flesh or skin, if it's too realistic, it reads as gross. But the, your work does not read as gross. It doesn't come across to me as that you're interested in the grotesque, even though you're showing the phenomenon of skin stretching and all of that. It, it's not about, like, let me freak you out. It seems like you're trying to seduce them, but then talk about that tension you mentioned between life and death, you know? Yeah, I think if you were to take an actual rabbit and eviscerate it and stretch it over a horn the way it stretched over the skid wouldn't do anything like, like I've, and I've, I've actually, I do take like a plastic bag and stretch it over something if I'm, if I'm confused um, and I can't figure it out, but I just make up the stretching. I just find these tension points and I just stretch from those points so I've got one more question about sculpture, and then we're gonna we're gonna shift gears and and talk about the Shape Theory Collective. But one of the things you use is you often have a hand that is mounted to the wall, or at least this was one body of work, and then the animal is wrapped around the hand. But it's interesting this whole idea that the hand is animate, and then that the animal is also animate, but it's somehow different, you know. But it's a human reference, you know, like when you're just making animals, 
I don't put myself in it the same way as when it is a physical hand coming out of the wall. So can you talk about choosing to have a human reference and then how much to choose to do? Because it's, it's literally just like maybe wrist forward of the hand, but it's, it's enough to get the idea across. I'm always interested in, in the way things could potentially stretch. And so one of the criteria that I use to select the animals that, that I make is it has to be from wh- where I'm from or it has to be something I killed. So I killed a buzzard once. And so, um, so that's why I made the buzzard, but more importantly is the buzzard just has that long neck, fleshy neck so that they can insert their heads into uh, a body, a a dead, dead carcass. But I just imagine that flesh being really stretchy. And I just wanted to see if I could manually stretch that with a hand and then Uh, And then the rabbit, we talked about the rabbit and then there's a turtle. I've never killed a turtle before, but um, it was a desert tortoise from where I was raised. We had desert tortoises out there. And again, the, the hand can stretch the fleshy tortoise skin neck. And then, you know, and I'm also thinking of genitalia and the hand stretching genitalia and there might be some there is sex references in there, sexual references. And then I remember, do you, did you see the two pe- pieces that uh, included the penis, male genitalia? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then the, the turtle head was the last piece I made before I made the, included the male genitalia. And I remember it was down in Togerville um, after I quit making pottery. I was talking to my then 16 year old son and I'm like, man, I feel like I should make a penis, but I'm afraid, (laughs) I'm afraid to, I really was afraid to. And and it took me forever to put that stuff online because uh, those two pieces online, just because I was really insecure about it uh, for a lot of reasons, living in a conservative state and my job, all that stuff. Uh, there's always in my mind, some mysterious entity out there that's going to cancel me. You know, some Mormon Mormon <laughs> authority that's going to say we can't let this person teach the youth of youth of Utah. <laughs> um, but anyway, I've finally gotten enough courage to put that work out there. Anyway, Eli said, uh, "Dad, you always tell us to do stuff that even if we're afraid." And he said, "You need to do it." I'm like, okay, I guess I better walk the walk, and and I'm glad I made those. I think they're nice pieces. And they're weird. They're really weird pieces. I think in, in that series, too, for some reason, when it's two animals interacting, my brain has an easier time connecting the two. And I just accept the reality of the animals. But then in that piece, it's it has an animal, a skull, uh, and then the penis, right? That's the the three there's things. A shoe, there's a high heel shoe. There's oh, one shoe, right. a high heel shoe oh, with a penis stretched over the heel and part of the part of the shoe and then there's one a, a, a hand stretching the the penis and then the penis is hanging and then there's the the flesh of the arm is stretched over a shoe as well yeah because there's something about that that it's a whole different symbolic language as soon as you put the high-heeled shoe in there that is it's another human thing that has such a sexual connotation well yeah it's totally fucking sexual for me i mean i, I got my proclivities. I got my shadow side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have my fantasies. Yeah, it's totally sexual for sure. And then the, I mean, I, I just think of these objects that are interesting to me. So like the, the high heel shoe is interesting to me for, for particular reasons, you know, fantasy, fetish, those kind of things, but also a frying pan is interesting to me. So that's the criteria is it has to be interesting to me. And the <laughs> frying pan is just interesting to me. Not, not like the, the shoe in terms of metaphor, but just the physical shape, the formal qualities of the frying pan. And so, I don't know, we, I was looking at this really interesting fry pan one evening frying eggs or something. And I'm like, Oh, I should see what I can do with this. And then I just stretched a rabbit over that fry, frying pan. If there is meaning, and there is meaning, there's always implicit meaning, but it's not always, I'm not always conscious of it. And so the the stiletto, uh, the hand, the fry pan, 
all those things. Like I've people have read fem, feminist or anti-feminist work in the fry pan, or um, and it's not none. Of, I don't think of think of making my work in those terms. It just has to be an interesting object to me and and a challenge to see if I could pull it off, see if I could just make the thing out of clay. And if I can make the thing and then attach another thing to it, that would be even more interesting. And then you get the synergism going. Yeah. And then the relationship and like, if this means this and this has this symbolism, what do those two symbols mean when they're together? And I don't have those answers. I'm just, those are questions that, that I pose when I'm making the work and I, I might have to die before I figure out what they all mean, you know, what the real deepest meaning is, because I think a lot of that operates on the subconscious. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Scut is a proud sponsor of the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler. Scut Ceramic Products has been in manufacturing equipment for potters since 1953. Their reputation as a pioneer in innovative kiln design continues with the fourth generation of this family-owned business. Their Kilnmaster touchscreen controller offers a sleek, smartphone-like interface that is both intuitive and packed with powerful tools that allow potters to easily program, diagnose, and remotely monitor their kilns. With five dedicated kiln technicians on staff and the most comprehensive network of distributors across the globe, you can be assured that Scut will be there for you before and after the sale. For more information on their line of kilns, visit scut.com. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by Amico Brent. For the past 100 years, Amico Brent has been creating ceramic supplies for our community, ranging from underglazes to electric kilns. With over 3,000 products, Amico Brent's top priority is making sure that all of their customer needs are met. From the professional to the student and everyone in between, their high-quality materials enable you to make your best work. To learn more, check them out at amico.com or on Instagram and Facebook at Amico Brent. You can also show them how you use Amico by sharing your work online with the hashtag HowIAmico. You mentioned that you feel like maybe there's there's a great Mormon cultural council that's going to cancel you. You know, <laughs> like that that's part of living in Utah. I mean, we should we should say you still live in Utah. You know, this is a, a very conservative state, and one of the things that you've become active in recently is something called Shape Theory Collective. And can you just tell us what the history of that? Like, what what became interesting about that that idea? Uh, did you go to that uh, in Sika talk? I, I, I watched it from home. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, listening in, in on that, man. I was so, I was scared shitless. <laughs> you did a good job. I practiced that, that talk in front of like 10 different classes here at Southern <laughs> Utah University where I teach. And and if you listen to it, you know, it's really pro cannabis and it's really pushing back against some of the, the stigma that um, cannabis has in this country starting way back when in the 1920s with that Anslinger guy. So yeah, the, the story behind, behind that is, well, I was on the Inseca board and during my three year tenure, we talked a lot about how to diversify the field. And I found myself becoming really defensive. Um, and I didn't know why I was like, wait, what do you mean? We're, we're diverse. You know, it's not our fault if it's all cis white dudes, you know, <laughs> Um, everyone's welcome, right? We don't have to do anything. And, um, but I, but I was defensive enough where I became curious about my defensiveness. And so I started to just read books and I didn't know where to start. I, I started with bell hooks, um, called something rage. I forgot. And I read a few of hers, one about the patriarchy and man, the word patriarchy was new to my vocabulary three or four years ago. And, and then the, the book that really had the biggest impact on me was the new Jim Crow. It was recommended to me by a very well-known ceramic artist. Um, and so I read that book and it just made me just blew my mind about the history of racism and policing in this country. And it just, if anything, it just made me more empathetic with 
the plight of pe people of color. And then the pandemic hit and right at the same time, we got new leadership on campus and whether or not this was the intended message, the message that was received was don't get comfortable. Nobody's jobs are secure because we're going to have major budget cuts and we don't know what the future holds and all that. And I was doing some fundraising um, at the time. So I kind of had my, I, I kind of understood the idea of development, even though Shape Theory Collective is, is a for-profit business at this point. It may turn into a nonprofit at some point, but and the fundraising I do on campus is so that students can go to places like Aramont. They have this, we have this partnership with, with them where they pay for one student and SUU pays for one. Or, or Aramont through the Wingate Foundation pays half of the tuition. So we have that partnership with them. And then we use some of that, I use some of that fundraising money to bring in visiting artists and those kind of things, mostly for experiential learning for students. So I understood I had that, I always I already had that inclination to do fundraising. And I was talking to a friend of mine a couple of years ago, and we were talking, and I, I probably had never used the word entrepreneur up until about a year and a half or two years ago. And she pointed out that fundraising, the way I was, and she was a donor to my, um, to my fund. She said, fundraising is entrepreneurism. And that just changed my whole world view like oh i'm an entrepreneur so so far we have the the leadership that says don't get comfortable we have my Insika board membership and being defensive and reading all these books then the pandemic the pandemic happened um and then the murder of george floyd happened and so i put all those things together and said i need it well when the when the um, leadership said your jobs aren't guaranteed, I decided I needed a backup plan. And, and so I put all those ideas, entrepreneurism, the murder of George Floyd, the new Jim Crow, I put all those things together and started Shape Theory Collective. And I don't remember how the last prisoner project came onto my radar. I, for the life of me, I can't remember it. Just one day it was, it was in my view. Um, I think I probably had a couple of glasses of wine and was surfing around and stumbled upon it or something. But the next day, I, I was going to donate to the Last Prisoner Project to free all the cannabis prisoners. Shape Theory Collective is a is a cannabis friendly, for profit online gallery that donates money to the Last Prisoner Project to help free the forty thousand cannabis prisoners that exist in this country. We should spell that out because I think a lot of people don't don't quite understand when cannabis became legal recreationally. It did not mean that they let people with cannabis charges out of prisons. So I think that it still takes a governor's. Um, I can't think of what you call it, where you officially pardon. I guess a pardon. Yeah, yeah. you you would have to be pardoned. Exonerate, expunge, all those things. Yeah, those are all. That's all new language to me. I love that I know all this stuff now that I didn't know a year and a half ago. But yes, you're right. So the goal of the project is to raise money to fund the Last Prisoner Project, which specifically works on helping people that are still incarcerated in the system for a crime that is no longer a crime. I mean, that's the craziest thing about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just like in my talk, I mentioned Seth Rogen and Martha, Martha Stewart and a former police officer who are all making millions of dollars off of cannabis. And I don't have any problem with them making millions of dollars off of cannabis. I just have a problem with people still in prison for cannabis. Um, and so like, I, I am pro cannabis, but it's really not about cannabis for me. It's more about the hypocrisy of the war on drugs. And the war on drugs has always been a race war. And I feel like it's just, a, a big problem, but a small component of a huge problem that that we can affect change. So so it's one spoke of the wheel of racism and over policing in this country that maybe we can help solve. And how can people find because you, you're selling art that is uh, the profit of that is divided and then, and then sent off to the last prisoner project. But how can people see the art or, or buy the art to support the project? Um, they go to shapetheorycollective.com and 
just peruse the artist and see we have several artists on there at this point what's true is that artists can sell their work anywhere like the the gatekeepers have left their posts right so we artists don't need a gallery to sell their work they don't need shape theory or any other gallery to sell their work because they have their own platform through social media and so what what shape theory offers is just an opportunity to to help in a problem that exists in this country um, and so when i approach artists to sell work on shape theory it's most usually a yes and if it's a no it's just because they're overly committed to other um, possibilities our stated goal is to donate five percent of the proceeds to the last prisoner project and that number came came with difficulty at first it was going to be 10 percent because i didn't want to seem stingy you know i wanted to be be generous but one of my business colleagues said well you know 10 percent. i don't think that's sustainable and then i was listening to a podcast of, about a woman that started a, a online sock company that used all natural dyes because her son had eczema and she couldn't find a pair of socks for her son so she started her own business and she donates five percent to a nonprofit that educates young women in third world countries so i thought oh, okay five percent and then I talked to Evelyn LaChapelle about, about that number. And she said, man, some people donate one, some five. It doesn't really matter. It's just what you can give. And so 5% is the number. Having said that, we're, I have to do the math, but I think we're averaging around 19% to the Last Prisoner Project because artists will donate 100% of their proceeds. And I donate 10% of the work that I make because if I sell a cup on shape theory collective and donate 10 percent. that means i'm getting 90 percent of the proceeds so so i can afford that we're shape theory really isn't doing doing that well at this point because of that that five percent does add up and then there's a lot of other fees like that i didn't anticipate like paypal fees and the wix fees and all that stuff so I mean, it's it's fine. the The long term goal, though, is to make it a really significant online gallery. One of the ideas that we have, and Sasha, Re, 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 I don't know how to say her last name, Reepstein. I don't think I. Anyway, she has a solo show up right now, and um, she made a couple of pieces exclusive for Shape Theory, a couple of ashtrays. And um, we're starting to dip our toe into the cannabis space. Originally, Shape Theory was going to be uh, a bunch of artists who don't normally make pipes, um, make pipes. So, so I would, in, I invited a bunch of artists to make pipes for shape theory. Cause I thought that was this really interesting alignment with the last prisoner project cannabis. And then I think about pipes, the way I think about teapots, like I wasn't raised on, on tea or drinking tea, but I made teapots all the time. And so I felt like, well, shoot, we can make pipes, even though we're not necessarily cannabis consumers we could still make pipes and then um i looked up the laws in utah and paraphernalia is actually illegal and i freaked out and a friend uh, a friend of mine a colleague of mine said well call this local attorney friend of mine and so i gave him a call and he said yeah um i understand that there are head shops in utah but the fact but they but they say those pipes are used for tobacco, not cannabis. But the fact that you're aligning yourself with the Last Prisoner Project and indirectly the War on Drugs and Black Lives Matter, um, it's clear, it's obvious what these are going to be for. And he said, I would just encourage you. And he said of the three prosecutors in this little town, he can, he can imagine two coming after me being a person of influence, teaching at a small university in this conservative town. And so, so I kind of, I really freaked out and was worried about my job because I'm, as I mentioned earlier, I was worried about my job already. And then if I'm this guy making pipes, you know, then so I, I lived with that disappointment for about a month and a half. And then I realized, Oh, I could just sell art. It doesn't have to be pipes. I can still do the same thing. But we're now dipping our toe into the cannabis space and not necessarily with pipes, but with ashtrays. And Nikki Blair is going to have a solo show. And I invited her to make a couple of pieces that were related to cannabis. I don't know what she's going to make. It could be a rolling tray or it could be an ashtray. 
And then we have Christopher David White. Do you know his work? I don't. He's the he's the artist that makes the figurative work where the skin it looks like wood. Uh, okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. He actually he's making pipes and so he's going to have a solo show with pipes. That's really the first time that shape theory is going to offer pipes for sale. I'm a little nervous, but my courage is a little bit stronger now. Boy, back a year and a half ago, I was scared shitless. I was like, oh my God, the (laughs) the DEA is going to come banging at my door, banging down my door, looking for my paraphernalia. (laughs) So I don't know how, I I don't know how that's going to go, but um, I don't know. I, you know, there's some laws in this. I mean, what are some laws that used to be that no longer exist because I don't know, like the Jim Crow laws. The, yeah. There's some laws that shouldn't be laws, you know, and paraphernalia shouldn't be illegal. So I guess not that I'm making it. Um, somebody else is making it and they're making it in a different state. So I, I don't know. I'm still a little, just talking about it. I'm feeling the fear. Well, what's interesting to me is that in the religious context of Mormonism and other Christian religions, you tithe. So you give 10%, you know, to the church. So it's interesting to start a gallery where the explicit idea is that we're going to give money to a a socially active cause that we believe in. And I think, or I hope people that are listening might consider this for their galleries or even any, any venture, you know, like one of the things I do in, in my local community is when I have a sale, I give to our local food bank. And I started doing that because I saw Brian Jones was doing the same thing in Connecticut. He was selling pots and he would give a percentage to the Connecticut food bank. I think sometimes as artists, we feel powerless. Like, what can we actually do? You know, Mm. can we do anything to make a social change? Well, what you can do is you can donate to places like food banks, to places like Last Prisoner Project, because they they're the ones fighting in the courts to get these outcomes to change. So I want to encourage people to do that. I agree. I, I don't know. I yeah. Yeah. Giving to the food bank. That's that's something that you can see a direct benefit. Like there's the ACLU out there and um, you can donate to the ACLU and that money does a lot of good. But for me, I feel like the Last Prisoner Project is uh, such a smaller organization that that I can see more of a direct impact, even though the ACLU will is just as important of an organization. But uh, I want to I want to contribute to something where I can actually see a direct impact. And that's. That's the nice thing about the the food bank is it's such a small organization in your local communities that you can actually see it benefiting somebody. Well, to wrap up, can you plug your social media and then also Shape Theory so that people could follow you you guys on Instagram there as well? Yeah, so russellrankle.com, that's pretty easy. Um, I don't update it that much. I have a couple of pieces I need to put on there. I do blog on there. I wish I wrote more because, you know, I've received a few compliments about my writing and it really means a lot. I want to write more and I should just do it and come hell or high water. And then Shape Theory Collective, that's the one that I spent a lot of time on. And so um, I think it's a pretty good website. I think there might be some usage issues, like we need to make navigation a little bit easier, but you can go up on the left corner and click current artist and it'll drop you down to all the artists that are permanently on display. And then it'll, it'll instantly pop up the solo show that we're hosting right now with Sasha. And she sold a few pieces um, already, but she has, I think three or four pieces left. It'd be fabulous if we can sell out. Well, man, it's good to see you. Thanks uh, for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you. I hope I was reasonably intelligent. (laughs) (laughs) I'd like to thank Russell for coming on the show. It was a pleasure to chat with him and hear more about Shape Theory Collective. Before I go, I wanted to thank today's sponsors, including the Woman Working with Clay Symposium, taking place June the 13th through the 15th at Holland University, as well as Amico Brent and Scut Ceramic Products. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor for the show, you can get in touch through our website. That's brickyardnetwork.org. 
I'll be back next week for the start of our 11th season. We officially turn 10 on May the 1st. So I'm looking forward to bringing you another decade of interviews with artists from around the world. So as always, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next week. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities whose lands we reside on in the United States and recognize that we are uninvited guests on the occupied, unceded, and ancestral lands of over 500 nations indigenous to North America. By acknowledging and reflecting upon the contemporary lived experiences and histories of the indigenous peoples here and globally, we may begin to take essential steps towards creating a more equitable world. Learn more through the hashtag HonorNativeLand initiative of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and consider contributing to Indigenous-led organizations doing important work to further health and wellness, sovereignty, and self-determination of the first people of the lands you reside. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.